everybody and welcome back to the Biff Rugby League podcast. It's episode number 22 and this week is not so much of a bumper episode. We haven't got as we haven't got as much to talk about and discuss and break down, but there is still plenty of talking points. But before we get into all those sort of discussions and little titty bits and everything, how are you both? Have you enjoyed your opening weekend of the Rugby League World Cup? Yeah, it's a proper like festival atmosphere in rugby league at the minute. I, there's a few negatives that we'll get onto, but overall, I felt like a real positive wave, and all all these people that um, have been coming up to me at work and stuff asking about it, and feels like we're getting a little bit of a uh, bit more publicity than usual. So I'm feeling really good, and I've I've managed to make myself um, down to two games this week as well. So I'm I'm like right up there, just living it. It's awesome. Yeah, it's good to get to games. I, I really can't wait to get to see New Zealand, Jamaica on Saturday. I feel like it's going to be a bit of a drubbing, but just to see the hack alive would be pretty good. Toby, are you enjoying the games that you've watched so far? Yeah, they've been good fun. Um, I think that, um, you know, there's been, well, there's already been um, something I'd call big surprise in the tournament, uh, which, was, which was a good watch. Um, and yeah, so I guess it, it's thrown out perhaps more than we could have hoped for in some ways. Um, but then in others, I think that, you know, I've, I'm left sort of wanting a bit more. Yeah, 100%. And, I mean, we'll, we'll mention it now. Greece and France game is still going ahead at time of recording. It's France 28, Greece 6 after 67 minutes. And it's nice to see Greece get on the board, score their first uh, try at a Rugby League World Cup. Obviously, Jamaica got their first points in the Rugby League World Cup, but obviously not being able to score a try. They're, they're obviously not going to win any games in this World Cup because the groups that they're in and the teams that they've got to play. But is it nice to see the journeys that both of these teams and the different journeys that both of these teams have made to get to this point and, the, the, to, and to see the development? I mean, like we said last week, Greece are apparently the 10th best team in the world. But our, I think if Greece were to play Jamaica, they'd only be the, they'd only be the 15th best team in the tournament and Jamaica would be last just on how I've seen it. But that that might be a close game. How do you two see the, their journeys and the, how you've seen them play so far this week? Yeah, I think the the whole Greece story of how they got to the World Cup is really cool. How, how um, it was actually illegal in their country for a short while, and they were playing like secret games that were they had to sort of like outrun the police and arrange them in secret and play overseas and stuff. So. That their story of getting here is, is the incredible thing. Um, I haven't I haven't watched this game yet, so I haven't yet seen them play. Um, but I did actually watch the Jamaica game live versus Ireland, mm. um, and I didn't think they were that terrible. I think they they could have done with um, a, a halfback just to kind of guide them in attack. They were sort of quite quite um, comfortable in in making meters and getting out of their own end and. Um, you know, some half line breaks and stuff like that, but just they just didn't have that finishing touch to to like make, get a proper line break and like find the space when it really counted. So yeah, it's a shame that um, they're not playing as well as I thought they would have, to be honest, because they have got some some good names in there, a bit of Super League talent, some strong Championship players as well. Um, but I, the other thing I like about Jamaica is just they they're pretty well supported in Leeds, so. I, I think there must be um, quite a few Jamaicans in Leeds um, or maybe people are just inspired. It's quite a culturally um, vibrant country, easy to get behind. Um, so that's been good. And, and I noticed as well that the head coach is actually Jamaican as well, which is really cool because that shows that, um, you know, in their country, they've not just got players that, have, that can come over here and play. They've got people that truly understand the game and that, that sets them up as a country well in the long run too yeah definitely it's such an inspiration story in terms of where some of their squad have come from i think they've got five players who play in the jamaican domestic league as well like there's obviously a few like that from greece and a lot of the other countries will have players that are from that domestic league obviously the french team have players from french clubs that aren't in that domestic league but they've come through the domestic system Toby, obviously Wales haven't played yet, so there's not really a lot to talk about there. But how are you looking forward to the game against? Is it Tonga or is it PNG on Wednesday night or tomorrow night? 
I can't remember which team it is. I'm pretty sure they start off against the Cook Islands. Yeah, sorry, they do. I've got it written in front of me. The Cook Islands on... Is it tomorrow night? Tomorrow, night, yeah. tomorrow night, Wednesday night. I, I can't remember. Wednesday, Wednesday night. Wednesday night. Yeah. How how are you how are you feeling going into that game? Obviously, the Cook Islands have got a, a, a nicer team than what probably people were expecting, or, but also maybe not as good as what others were expecting. I mean, there's definitely players in that Cook Islands squad, or sorry, in the New Zealand squad, and you're looking at the Australia squad. You've got Val Holmes, Charles Nickel uh, Klockstad, and Jordan Rapina, who aren't in that team. So it's it's quite nice to see those guys not selected, isn't it? Or not able to play for the Cook Islands. Yeah, I mean, I think that the games we've seen so far have shown us that uh, that coaching is going to be a huge part of this World Cup. And, you know, a lot of squads of players who have not really spent any time together being put together and given three weeks to try and figure out how to perform to the best of their ability. And I think we've seen that happened um yeah, that's, England have done a really good job of that. I think we've seen that Italy have done a really good job of that. So part of me feels like John Key has actually done quite a consistent job of selecting uh, this Wales squad. I mean, he's got Kelly Bacon coming in for the first time, but Elliot Key has been in the squad for years and years now. And, um, you know, he's been, he's been joined by the likes of uh, Matty Fozard in the squad before, and he's even had Conor and Curtis Davis in the squad with him before. So I think that, you know, um, Rodri, Rodri Jones from Swinton. Rodri Lloyd, the uh, second rower. Lloyd, yeah, the second rower. Yeah. Sorry, there's, there was another Rodri I think. Anyway, <laughs> Rodri Lloyd um, from Swinton, you know, he's been in the squad for ages. So part of me thinks that maybe, you know, if the Cook Islands aren't able to throw themselves together into a squad, um, then this Wales squad actually could be coached into win, winning the, this game. Um, so I think that. You know, there is a bit more hope to me now that I've sort of gone, oh, well, maybe what we know in the past about quality of players isn't quite as um, important as it perhaps was in 2017, 2013, etc. Yeah, and I think that probably lies a little bit on the, the Italy-Scotland game, which we'll, which we'll get into now. Very disappointing from a Scottish point of view, but when you look at that Italy squad, and, and we all predicted Scotland to win that game, because we looked at the squads and we looked at the players available and we thought Scotland have got a little bit better talent, they've got the players that... But Italy were just on form. And I think it's because a lot of those Italian players, when they do have fixtures, even though the last fixture was three years ago, a lot of them were in and around that squad three years ago. Their squad doesn't change a lot in three years, whereas the Scotland and the Ireland and the Wales sides, they change depending on which players aren't selected for the Tier 1 nations. And sort of which I don't know which country you want to you want to touch on first, but back on that Scotland Italy game, what were your winners and losers in in that? Because I think there was definitely a lot more losers on the Scottish sort of point of view. But I don't really know where to touch on this and and sort of was it more of a Scotland disappointment or was it Italy just paying above and beyond what everyone thought they were capable of? The two players that stood up for me for for the Italians was the um, the halfback. And I've forgotten his name, but it was pretty cool. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure he plays at the Sydney Roosters. Um, and the winger who's got a hat trick, Mason. Yeah, um, Jake Mason was really good. Yeah, two players that I'll be honest, I um, hadn't really heard of before before this World Cup. Um, but they both they both played really really well together. Um, and I think I think it was just I think it was cool. I really liked enjo- enjoyed watching um, that Italy game play. Um, but yeah, shame, shame for Scotland. It, it sort of shakes things up in that group a little bit now. Yeah, definitely, because we, we were thinking, oh, whoever wins this game is going to battle, um, I believe, Fiji for the second spot. Um, and we were like, okay, Fiji weren't great against England. Then they were even more disappointing against Australia with better... And this this is the thing, right? A, re- a, a not 100% England team put 50 on an on a not 100%, 100% fully fit Fiji team. Australia didn't put 50 on a fully fit Fiji team, but obviously Australia weren't probably their 100% because of the players that they rested. That To me, that means that Fiji are a little bit more disappointing in terms of the way they've played. Scotland have the squad and the players that we know can play to that level. Do they get a shock win over Fiji? Do, do Fiji beat Italy? Like whoever finishes second in that group now, it's so open, 
And uh, but I think, like you said, that the Italian halfback. I think you meant uh, Jack Camp and Campagnolo. Um, That's it. Yeah. He the standoff. He was unbelievable. He he sort of he knew what exactly he wanted to do with the ball. He knew what to do with the ball at the right time, and just sort of ran the show. And it was quite nice to, because Cooper Johns wasn't in the World Cup, but for whatever reason. There was no, there's no John's brothers. No, sorry, is it John's brothers or John's cousins? I don't know what they are. Jones, yeah. yeah, they're not in this Italy squad. And imagine if they were, because I think the Italy squad would be dangerous with those two in it. Yeah, and they were scoring some like quite fun, attractive tries as well. Mm. So, and that that to me that comes from like a team that understands each other. They know where they're gonna, where the the person's gonna be. They can rely on them to hit the gap, find the space. So that's like a really good sign that they've got their combinations just right. Yeah, and when it comes to those combinations, was it a surprise to see Scotland line up the way they did with really being given the seven shirt, but then lining up at fullback? Um, or like Lock Lachlan Wormsley was at fullback, Davy Dixon on the wing, Liam Hood was meant to start. And it just seemed a little bit off. The team didn't look 100%. In just the way they they were playing, the, the positions they were playing, the numbers they were given, just didn't seem well structured in in the way I was looking at it. Yeah, especially when you consider that, like you know, last week when we were going through the squads, and I said, look, it's been really hard to sort of place anyone who hasn't got a Wikipedia page. Yeah. And Scott with Breer going to fullback, Scotland halves are two players without Wikipedia pages, which sounds ridiculous. That shows the lack of experience that their half combo had in directing them around the pitch and instructing the game. Um, it, I think that also, yeah, they just looked slightly off the ball. Um, you know, I think that this Italy squad does have a lot of sort of New South Wales and Queensland Cup players, which perhaps, you know, was there's a consideration of you've got a sort of a championship lower end Super League squad against um, a New South Wales Queensland Cup squad. How do they match up? Um, I guess that's a very real consideration to make. Yeah, definitely. Um, just touching on another one of the home nations before we obviously we, before we get into the big one of England versus Samoa, Ireland looked very very good. Um, was this another game that you were at, um, Robin? Yeah, I was at that game. I liked uh, Luke Carey got man of the match. Um, I don't think he played the full game. I'm pretty sure they brought on Brendan O'Higgins for the sort of end. Yeah, I think he only um, played like an hour. The game. I believe he only played an hour of that game, and but still, yeah. it, was, it was a very important hour, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Like, and the way the way that um, Richie Myler linked up with him as well was was quite impressive. Like, that's quite a dangerous um, partnership they've got there. It was quite interesting, actually. Um, Jamaica kind of were defending with almost like two fullbacks. Yeah. The um, the, the the fullback would sort of sit quite close. So whichever side of the pitch. Um, the ball was at the winger on the opposite side was dropping back, and so it actually, I, I'm sure that they were anticipating um, that they had a lot of options for, for short kicks. Um, but what it kind of left was it meant that um, Jamaica were a bit short in the defensive line, mm. and um, I think they were, I think that Jamaica thought that it would entice Ireland to go wide, but actually they found a lot of um, meters. Through, through like inside balls, which is exactly where like your half back and your full back linking up is, is dangerous. So I feel like they were given plenty of room to like take advantage of that and, and they and it was they, they, they came off more times than they didn't. So that island team's looking really good. Um a couple of like silly mistakes. Um actually I, I think that the the front row let them down a little bit. Yeah so it was that's a bit maybe disappointing. Yeah, that's maybe their weakness. Um, but I, I would be very happy to see if I was if I was Irish, I'd be very happy to see that team come together. And um, I think they'll only get stronger as they play together a bit more. And also, like, how nice is that island kit as well? <laughs> I want yeah, to get my hands on it. <laughs> I really want one just to hang it on the wall. I don't even. I wouldn't even wear it because I just. I don't feel like I could ever wear another nation's shirt. I mean, I say that, I've worn my Saudi Arabia jersey, which just seems a little bit controversial. But uh, <laughs> just touching on, w watching it on the TV, I don't know if you saw this, Toby. There was, a, there was a bit of dilemma between whether Ireland had lost a substitute or not. Um, originally, they named Josh Cook to start, and Brendan O'Hagan ended up starting the game, and I think Joe Key started on the bench. 
um, for Ireland, and it was a bit sort of. And Ireland said that they they made the changes before a time limit, and they had apparently they hadn't gone through, so they lost an interchange. Ireland appealed it; they got the interchange back because of because of a system error. Did that come through? in the game i mean to start the island were a bit sort of off the boil in the first five ten minutes of that game and maybe that did affect them a little bit i don't know if i don't know if you spotted that live robin but toby did, no, did, I... did, you, did you catch that on telly if you watched it no i didn't i didn't really pay much attention to it to be fair yeah but did it did it come across live for you robin did they did that sort of did there seem like there was a little bit of i mean an iron on the sideline at all uh, I I'll be honest. I I didn't notice that. I was kind of I was just watching the ball, so I I, I would have missed that. But um, yeah, that's interesting. I, I've not like I've not heard of that before. I mean, really, it didn't it didn't have too much of an impact on the end result of the game. But there there would be some real controversy if that was the final or like a really close game and the player they brought on ended up kicking the winning goal or something. So yeah, yeah. it's a bit it's a bit concerning. A little bit. Essentially, a bit un- unprofessional. Like you'd like to think that like that sort of thing can't happen at a World Cup. Like we're too on it. But yeah, definitely. Yeah. it's um, it's a bit odd that that's happened. There's been a couple of technical glitches, both in the opening ceremony and by the way, Greece have just scored an absolutely wonderful try. That is beautiful. Jordan Mead has just done a crossfield kick. I think on like the second tackle inside his own half, and whoever's wearing number four, I can't see his name. But he's claimed it, and he's turned the full back. He's turned Morgan Esquerre absolutely inside out, and that was that was gorgeous. For anyone that has has not seen it or hasn't watched the game, like was at time of listening, go and watch that. Nick um, Nicholas Mugia's first try of the match. Like Greece have scored twice. This is phenomenal. Forty meters out from his own try line, picks kicks the ball ahead fifteen meters, and Mugius outpaces. Uh, Arta Romano and then turns Morgan Escari inside out and oh it's beautiful um, I forgot where I was now but yeah I Ireland just I think Ireland Lebanon then we'll move on to that because Le- Lebanon looked a little bit disappointing against New Zealand obviously you're playing against the number one ranked team in the world you're playing against some of the best players on the planet in the in uh, Joseph Manu um, Ronaldo Mulatalo a halfback pairing that we probably weren't expecting to see the forward packs of like the two best props in the NRL this year, arguably one of the best loose forwards in the game in, in Tarpane as well. But they would have been disappointed with the way they played and the way they shut down. And especially from from me, from the West Point of West Tigers point of view, really disappointed to see Adam Dwayne and Robbie Farah both sent off in that game. Really disappointed to see, especially for a blast on a referee for abusive and foul language towards a match official. Yeah, no. that. Um, do, do you want to expand a little bit more what exactly what happened? Because I'm I'm a little bit fuzzy about how it all went down. So there was a kickoff, and I believe a Lebanon player got run off the ball, and Robbie Farad has has is picking up the tee, and I think both him and Adam Dwayne have blasted the referee for making a, a bad error again because they feel very much like the referees missed another decision a lot of decisions did go against lebanon like it was a very 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 poor referee in performance but you i don't think there's any excuse to spray the referee like that i just i genuinely don't i, I just don't think you're able to, i just don't think that's on at all so yeah, yeah. It, after an hour both sent off so it's just yeah i don't know I don't think there's. I know that West Tigers have been on the end of a few dodgy decisions from referees, and maybe the frustrations boiled over. Maybe it's the same referee that robbed them in that game, and Adam Dwayne's had enough of it, of him, and he's just let him know how he yeah. feels about him. But we we can't stand for abuse of anyone in the game at any level. Yeah, it's definitely right that they've been sent off. Then I mean, it's quite concerning when somebody like um, a trainer gets sent off because you think. Like you, you've got absolutely no right. Sort of a player in the heat of the battle is wrong, but you can sort of understand the, if their emotions get the better of them. But when it's a trainer, you just think that's not your place to even be within earshot of the referee. So that's totally wrong. Yeah. And I mean, they're, they're both West Tigers players, so they should be used to losing. I, I don't know why <laughs> they've let, let it get the better of them. Yeah, it's um, it was a little bit confusing at the time, and it took 
it took Andrew Voss, the, the commentator, a good while to figure out what was going on. I think it was about 15 minutes later that something had happened. Um, Michael Check has, has said he was sent off for saying something to the referee. That's pretty clear. But that's an accumulation of frustration that comes off the back of a try where there's no play the ball from Brandon Smith and continual blocks on the kickoffs. It should never happen, obviously. But, but you know, if those things are both handled right, we are obviously considered as the lower tier team. There's a certain perception there and that's how it rolls. We'll just see what happens. There's no point worrying about what happened and, and it's not really clear because there are conflicting stories. There'll be a method to find out what happened and from there we'll be able to make a call on it. It's a shame we can't make the decision now because they're unable to find that footage with the audio on it. I'm not sure why. That's another thing I was going to mention. I couldn't hear. I've not heard referee mics in a lot of the games. You, every Super League game you watch and every NRL game you watch that's televised, you can hear the referee. Every Challenge Cup game, you can hear the referee. Every international game previously that we've watched, you can hear the referee. Even in the wheelchair game, you can hear the referee's microphone. Why are we not hearing all the referee mics in this World Cup? Like, what, what do you make of that situation, Toby? I mean, I think they probably just forgot to buy referee mics or something. You know, it'll be some sort of oversight, I think. Yeah. Um... Has it got anything to do with it being on the BBC, do you think? I don't, I don't know. Watching it on Sky. I don't know, because the BBC, have, you've been able to listen to referee mics in the Challenge Cup, and you can hear mics at like other sporting events that they do, um, especially mm. like Rugby Union. It's, not, it's never a problem in the Six Nations, and they're not covering any of that at the moment. So I, I just don't know what the issue is. I, maybe, it's, maybe there's just more tech issues. We had a tech issue at the welcoming. We've had tech issues with the island team. We've had tech issues with potentially more tech issues with referee mics. I just think maybe it's just been a little bit sort of let slip, maybe by sort of the organisers and stuff. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. Um, just quickly on that Adam Dwayne situation, it is understood that Dwayne claims he told Atkins give us some effing calls, and then was stunned when the NRL whistleblower pointed to the sideline and sent him off. So. Yeah, he will miss the next game. So he will miss the game against Ireland at the weekend. Does that make that yeah. game a lot more winnable for Ireland now that he's not playing? Yeah, he's a key part of that Lebanon side. and um, Yeah, that's that's a real shame. He'll be kicking himself for that. Yeah, definitely. Um, we'll move on then to the big one. It, it's a, it's a, Robin, you're probably the most disappointed out of any of us because you predicted Samoa to win this game. And England blew them off the park. Like, there was a lot of chat before when they compared Jack Wellsby to Jerome Luai, and a lot of people were saying, Jack who? How are you comparing the Super League to the NRL? Like, this guy has never played at a top level. He's playing in a pretty much a pro-am league. Jerome Luai is one of the best halfbacks in the world. Mate, it looked like the other way around. It looked like Jack Wellsby had just won an NRL Premiership at the weekend, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I Go on, Todd. Well, no, absolutely. I think I've been saying, I mean, I was saying, like, back, like the first World Cup squad, but, like, Jack Wellsby is there. He's, like, in the heartbeat of the team. And you two at that point were a bit, like, maybe not yet. And I think I think you would have all agreed by the end of this season that Jack Wellsby, you know, belonged there. And I think that, for me, he was, he is the English player who could be the best player in the, you know, who, who could be the best player in the world. Like, I think he's that good. That we could put that tag on Jack Wellsby at some point. I find it funny. Uh, I was watching during the game, obviously with like uh, Erling Haaland coming across to the Premier League, and he's been all over, uh, you know, sort of TV and stuff. I feel like him and Jack Wellsby have a very similar run, um, <laughs> which made me laugh. Um, but that's just reference for anyone who sort of watches football out there. <laughs> but yeah, Jack Wellsby. Um, I think it's like you know. I have no sort of qualms with saying that he, he can be as good as Jerome Luai. Um, and yeah, I think that, in all fairness, his power and speed, actually, was probably the best attacking weapon in England had. Yeah, oh, well, I don't know. I, I think Dom Far I, did, I think um, Dom Young's speed um, is probably a little bit more than maybe Wellsby's and his power is a little bit more. But in terms of what... Wellsby can do with the ball compared to Dom Young with, especially in hand and in attacking positions the way those two linked up at the weekend the way Williams was linking up with, with Wellsby as well Tompkins as captain didn't necessarily need to lead the side he just needed to be a little bit more composed I was really pleased with the way Victor Radley led the forward pack um, Mickey McAloran making the most tackles in the game 
uh, for the England side. Really, really like I was when Akers played really well against Fiji. I was a little bit disappointed to see McLaurin start, but he's shown again when the big games come that he's really solid defensively. And it doesn't matter what he does with the ball when you've got the likes of Williams, Wellsby, and Tompkins outside of them. Yeah, I actually noticed that um, Tompkins went in behind the play of the ball quite regularly as well. So I'm pretty sure that was part of the game plan to help cover McLaurin and maybe give him a bit of a breather so that he can put in that defensive effort. I'm, I'm certain that that was part of the game plan. Um, like you say, I, I am really shocked by this result. Um, obviously, I enjoyed it, but um, I still think that that Samoa team was poor. I think that they were really unorganised. Um, obviously, they had so many great individuals in that team, but there was no combinations. They didn't link up with each other. Um there was what well, their only try was an intercept, so it was basically yeah. a gift. I I just think yes, I, they won, they beat Samoa, and everyone's building Samoa up. So now we we can be confident. But I I, I think that we've caught them napping there. I I don't think that that's the best Samoa could have played. Um, I'm 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 super happy, obviously, and it's really positive that like a lot of the young players actually stepped up, like. Like Don Young and Jack Wellesby, that that's um, positive for the future of the English game. But I still think that we're going to have to stay grounded because I would hate for us to win the next two and then lose in the um, first round of the of the finals. So I, I still think we've got a lot a lot to do to catch up to to Australia and New Zealand. But um, yeah, maybe maybe third place is a bit more realistic. We'll have to see how Tonga goes. Um, what what will be tomorrow night? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm surprised. I am shocked, and I will take back what I said about this England team being the worst. Maybe they're not they're not so bad after all. And I think a lot of that's down to uh, Sean Wayne. Um, I think that the fact that you've got a coach who, you know, knows how to make a team defensively solid, but also. Has picked players who he, you know, he's seen the ability to get something special out of. Um, I think is like really, really credit how good a coach he is. Um, and yeah, I think like that for me was the main point is that he had a team which came into that game ready and sm- running smooth, and Samoa came into that game like not really knowing, you know, what the game plan was. Probably a lot of boys going, "Oh, this is how we do it at Penrith," and then everyone else is like, "Oh well." Well, what are we supposed to do then if you know, we, we've never been coached by Ivan Cleary? So how do we how are we supposed to fit into this game plan type thing? Yeah, definitely, hundred yeah. percent. I mean, the last time England played Samoa was back in two thousand and seventeen. England won thirty points to ten, but when you look at the teams that day, the England team clearly is a lot is a lot better. Samoa have Sam Cassiano, Antonio Winterstein, Anthony Milford, Tim Lafive, uh, Peter Godinay, Junior Paulo, Kemma Marlowe. Jenny Metaltia, Lisa Armau, uh, Peter Metaltia, Joey Lilua, Josh Maguire, uh, Farah Muna Brown, John Asiata, Suayi Matagi, uh, Sosea Sui, and Herman Sasa. Only one of those lads played in the Samoa team that played the other day. Whereas you look through the England squad, Watkins is in there, um, McMeekin's in there, Whitehead's in there, Chris Hill's still in there, Tom Burgess is in there. So. It shows that the, even though the England squad is very different in the fact that there's only five of that seven team, the players in that squad have all played with everyone else that they've just brought in. Players players that play for Samoa don't necessarily get to play with each other as often as the English lads do. And maybe that's without the warm-up game and without the, the proper camp that they've had and everything else, maybe that really was just a bad start. Maybe Samoa could have done with England being the third game in the group like I, I tell you what I think England are very lucky to have got that game out of the way and got such a dominant win because I think then that now means we get a nice e- well we get a slightly easier um, quarter final from, from that group that has Tonga Wales Cook Islands PNG in it at least we don't I think in our eyes now we don't have to worry about Tonga in the quarter final as long as, they, as, long as Tonga win <laughs> as, long as, as long as Tonga win which I think I think Looking at their squad, and well, we say this, it's the same about the Samoa, isn't it? Looking at their squad, but yeah, they're, they're not playing as strong, a t- they're not playing as strong a sides in England, are they? The, the Tongans, um, 
Another negative, though, from the World Cup is the lack of attendance. It's, it's, it's low attendance, this isn't. They were, they were pushing for, oh, it's nearly, they were saying, oh, it's sold out at St. James's Park. It's, it's sold out. It wasn't sold out. There was over 5,000 seats remaining. Yes, there were still 45,000 people there, but it wasn't sold out. None of the grounds so far have been sold out. Is that, is that, is that an organisation problem because the prices of tickets is so high? The tickets are really expensive this time round, and I think I, I'm I'm undecided. We've only seen five games, and it's right at the start. It, it's either going to be the thing that the the Achilles heel of the whole competition, or it's going to be a masterstroke because it's going to lead to such an increase in revenue. I, I'm not sure how, which way it's going to go yet. I mean, for me for me personally, I I knew I wanted to to see these games, so um, I booked almost all of my tickets back in 2020 when they were much, much cheaper. So, um, yeah, I, I can see now if, if it's going to be difficult to get neutrals that have maybe picked it up and are thinking, oh, maybe I will get some tickets, when you think a lot of the cheaper sections have sold out yeah. and the only options are like 85 quid each, 55 quid each. It's, yeah, um, definitely. It's, it's a tough sell. Um, but we'll see. I mean, who... If if the the attendance is it's all is it price elastic? Is the reducing demand going to be great greater than the increase in revenue? We'll have to wait and see, and it might be a massive stroke. Who knows? Yeah, Toby, is that because obviously me and Robin we bought tickets a few years ago, and you kept saying, "Oh, I'll wait a little bit. I'll wait to see what's going on." And now I guess you've looked at the prices and gone, "It's probably a little bit too expensive for me to want to get to these other games because." If they were 20 quid cheaper, you can justify travelling that little bit further because the prices in terms of your day out is the same. But the fact that they're... I mean, there's tickets in... Hull FC fans are complaining that they've got to spend 70 quid to sit in their usual seat to watch a World Cup game that isn't going to sell out. Why should they have to pay 70 quid? I know it's the World Cup, but they're probably only paying 20 quid to go and watch Hull FC. Why is it not, why is it not only 40 quid to sit in that seat? Why is it like 300% more? I guess those prices have put you off a little bit. I mean, the issue that, like, the main issue I'm facing is one is that, like, so Saturday is for the football, so that's just, you know, that's just not really doable for me. Um, but then also it's that on top of the ticket, I've got to pay for travel, and the closest place for me to travel is Leeds, and that's like, that's like twenty pound on the train probably return, um, which isn't too bad. Bear in mind that's with a rail card, but yeah, you know that isn't too bad. But you already go like. Okay, heading the or Evan Road, plus a rail card. Oh, and it's an evening kickoff, so there isn't actually a train back to get. Or if there is, it stops off at Sheffield. I mean, I'm in, stuck in Sheffield or something like this. Yeah. Um, mm. Yeah, it's just like, it's just not, it's just at a point where there's too many logistical dynamics. I mean, I was, I was on the train to Accrington away with Derby, and our first train was Derby to Leeds, and that train was Birmingham to Newcastle train. Jesus and that God. train, I. I passed a solid four or five rugby league ships coming up, making the journey up from Birmingham up through to Newcastle, um, you know, for that game. So that was something which I was quite impressed by. Um, I wasn't expecting to see that on the train. So um, that was good. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's just, I don't know, I just feel like I, I can't really comment on the attendances because I should be, I'm the kind of person who should be at some of those games. But I just feel like it's, it feels almost like inaccessible, but then at the same time, um, I was in a situation where I was getting a university commitment coming at me. Uh, I was finding them out in October before mm. the World Cup still. I was yeah. finding them out at the start of October, and it was just too short a turnaround. And then, yeah, it's too expensive to book soon. Um, but another interesting point I'll make is that obviously Wales are having their first group games in Lee. Yeah. Um, Leeds, Leeds within an hour of Wrexham, for example, and I know somebody from Wrexham who knows the Rugby League World Cup has been happening for ages. Um, this is someone I know, like, I only know because I've followed them on Twitter and I've, I've met them, like, twice in person type thing. It's nothing, yeah, uh, you yeah. know, I'm not a close friend of them, but they tweeted today saying, like, oh, I knew the Rugby League World Cup was happening for the, uh, I know the Rugby League World Cup's been happening for the whole year. I didn't know Wales were in it until, uh, until, like, today type thing. That's great. Um, yeah. And then all of a sudden, that like, well, maybe you know, if everyone knew, they'd all go a year in advance. And, oh, okay, that day we'll book it off work a year in advance. We'll drive to Lee. Um, yeah, definitely. You know, there's that kind of like 
that element of it, and I feel like maybe, you know... Um, yeah, I feel like that there hasn't been the best publicist, publicity for the Rugby League World Cup, for, bearing in mind that we've had we've had an extra year to push the hell out of it. I feel like it's not been very well publicised. I think it's overly extensive, um, especially if you go into games at like Warrington and, and Headingley, and then you're going to have to stand and for for an hour and a half. Like people don't necessarily want to stand at rugby games now. A lot of people enjoy sitting there and actually watching it. It's it's totally different. I mean. It's 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 I'm like very interesting to see what the Australia Scotland, uh, I believe it's Australia Scotland game is going to be like on Friday night in Coventry. I'm I'm very intrigued to see how well that's sold because it's not in the rugby league heartland, but it is the one of the best teams in the world. Are you going to get people? Are you going to get a lot of people from London travel in terms and the Midlands travel? I really really hope so. Are you going to get people travel down from Yorkshire and Lancashire? I really really hope so. But it, with, as as the rugby as the as the tournament goes on, we'll have a look. And also, I want to see yeah. how the men's um, attendances compare to some of the women's attendances, especially when you look at games being held in York for both. I think there's men's games in York as well, isn't there, Robin? Um, is there? I don't think. I think they're all women's games. Are they all York? women's games. Okay. Well, so yeah. It would it would have been interesting to it, well if there's if there's t- stadiums where both men and women's games are being played, it would be very interesting to see. How the how the attendances yeah. compare um, for for those fixtures as well, and obviously in the wheelchair game and, and things like that. I can't wait to get to some yeah. of the wheelchair games. We're going to move yeah. on from the world oh, quickly. Go on, say what you want to say. Well, I was just going to say I think it's mental that like we've got England, Scotland, Wales, and and you can make an argument for Ireland in this competition, but everything's been played in England. Like Toby said, he's, he's got mates that are aware of the World Cup. Yeah, live like in Wrexham. We could have easily had a one, just one Welsh game in Wrexham, one Scottish game in in Edinburgh, or some just to shake it up. Like you've got Lee an hour away from the north of Wales, and then you've got Newcastle an hour away from the south of Scotland. Mm. Yeah. That's it. That's all that, that, that those two countries have got. I mean, I get Ireland's a little bit more difficult, but I just think they could have maybe picked places like i mean ireland for example you probably could have played an ireland game down in london because there's plenty of irish people down there definitely yeah liverpool maybe like there's there's these sort of like communities that where you just think maybe that would have been better suited to to put that game there but yeah i mean cardiff arms park is a prime example of a, a probably maybe not maybe not for wales but the, the Cardiff Rugby League women's side, they looked at playing their games at Cardiff Bar Park. There was an agreement for that. And then obviously our, that just before the start of the season, that was that was knocked away. But somewhere like Cardiff Arms Park, just to hold the first Wales game of this World Cup, that would have been phenomenal. Just because then you've got, you know Welsh people are going to go and watch Wales in a game of rugby, whether it's union or league. Like you probably sell out Cardiff Arms Park just just for that evening and then those fans then go oh i want to go to the next game let me make sure that in a week let me even if it's a week notice they're going to be able to get tickets and potentially go um is that something you would have liked to see toby if, if there was a game in wales do you think a lot more of your family and friends back home would have would have gone to watch them um well i mean I, i'm not sure um you know um i think there definitely would have been people I know who would have gone um, but yeah it's uh, it's difficult because there's that sort of element of like there's no players in that Wales squad that someone that a casual rugby league fan would be able to identify with or you know there wouldn't there, there isn't even like a backlog of good things Wales have done because you know it's not if it is being put on recorded and put on somewhere it's not being recorded in, even in HD in some instances you know there's, it's hard to put higher packages together it's hard to make a well marketed um, advert for the international game and I just, I don't know, I feel like there would have been, and also last time Wales played in that because they, they lost the Cook Islands, they lost the USA in, <laughs> in rugby, which is farcical to a Welsh person who expects their country to be good at rugby regardless of the format. Yeah, definitely I mean, you wouldn't have wanted to lose to the USA in any sport um, if you're a, if you're any country in the world it's not very nice to lose to them and it's not even very nice to get a draw against them as England football fans are very much aware. Um, we're going to move on from the World Cup really quickly and I, I want to talk Sleeper League and I want to talk a little bit about the Championship and stuff. Before we get into Huddersfield Giants and their recruitment and how their squad is looking unbelievably good next season, Robin, Andrew Henderson has been announced as the new York 
Rugby League Football Club Knights head coach on a five year deal. Um, while you mull on that, tell me what you think about the rebrand, please. So, I, when I first saw it, I thought, yeah, it's about time that the, that the brand is updated. It's it, as long as I can remember the Knights, they've played under that same logo and they have changed their colours up, but it, it is a bit dated and, and maybe it needs a change. But I was nervous as what as what they were going to do because it, you know what you know what it's like as a fan you get attached to these things mm. and change change is bad. So at first I wasn't sure, but I think I've come around to the idea. Um, I'm a bit I'm a bit confused because they've done the the what do they call it York RLFC Knights, yeah, which doesn't is a bit I don't know it's a bit odd. And actually I think the RLFC feels a little bit amateur. I think they could have just been called. York RL Knights. I feel, yep. I feel like that makes it that's a bit better. So it makes it more like the centre of rugby league in York. Mm-hmm. Um, the logo itself is is pretty modern. It's gonna it's gonna translate well in in the modern age on social media, and um, it'll be cheaper to print on t-shirts and things like that. Um, it sort of loses its charm a little bit. The old Knights badge was. I feel like it was based off the, the old New South Wales badge, so it did feel like a proper rugby league one, whereas this one could be any sport. That's probably one of my criticisms. And the other thing that's a bit weird is the, the women's team being called the Valkyries. Now, I, I like that they begin with their own identity. I like that it ties... The two clubs are clearly linked, but they, 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 they're a separate team now, and I think that's pretty cool, and it's um, quite novel as well. But the only thing that is a little bit confusing is Valkyries... I'm pretty sure that's a Viking thing. They're like Viking gods. Yeah, Nor- Nordic, team, I believe that is. Yeah, so. yeah, Nordic gods. Whereas a men's team, knights, is that's kind of like English, Anglo-Saxon sort of yeah. thing. So it's, it's a little bit confusing. I know York's a historic place, and we've had both of those groups of people in our town and, and shaped it in many ways. So it sort of makes sense, but... I think you would only really get it if if you knew that about York, and you're sort of like doing a bit of mental gymnastics to get there. Yeah, so definitely. So that's the only thing that's a little bit confusing. Like I think in an ideal world, really, we'd be York Vikings, but um, obviously, with witness has got that one. So yeah, witness put that, and we don't know, we don't understand why. The thing that it does to me is, other than having the RLFC there, if it was just York Knights, to me, it just looks like a basketball logo. Like, it looks like it could be yeah. a basketball team, and that's just the way I, I see it. Um, whoever owned the York RLFC Twitter handle, by the way, they just made a lot of money because um, that was owned by someone and has been owned by someone since 2016. So whether that was owned by the club back in 2016 and this is just a delayed sort of, we want to do this, um, that would be very interesting Maybe. to find out. But your first head coach as York RLFC Knights is going to be Andrew Henderson, who's joined from... Uh, uh, just promoting Keithley from League One. So, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, um, pretty, pretty. I'm pretty pleased with it. I'll be honest with you. I think um, he's a, he's a switched on guy, isn't he, Andrew Henderson? He, he's involved with the media. Um, he's, uh, he's, he's yeah, he's helped out at um, Keith, um, Keithley, and I'm pretty sure he was um, head of rugby there as well. Yeah, he was. Yeah. So, so that may. And he's also he's been an assistant coach at Warrington and a head coach at Sheffield. Or did he play at Sheffield or something? Oh, he's, he's done, the Broncos, I think. Yeah, he's done a lot of head coaching and assistant coaching roles at teams when yeah. they've gone through good periods. And I think this is now yeah. his time to take York to to the next level. Like we're still I'm in an iron about which teams are going to get uh, A's, B's, or C's in the new grading system. York are currently, in what I, from what I've heard, still a favourite to get an A. A five-year deal with a head coach, a new rebrand, a nice stadium, two teams, yeah. plenty of money behind the club. Like m- maybe this is this is the next super team in in the top tier. Maybe this is they've just been building and building and building and waiting because they just knew something was happening. Um, yeah, I, actually, so the, at my work, the my my the company I'm employed by actually sponsor the night. So the directors at my company have like a bit more of a close relationship with um, Clinton Child, the owner. And um, this is a, this is an inside scoop right here on the bit. So um, <laughs> I was told earlier in the week that 
um, Clint had, had told my director if um, if the grading was done today and announced that the York Knights would have been fifth ranked in the country, so they would have been the fifth best team based on the IMG grading. So wow. I don't know exactly how that's possible, considering I'm I'm pretty sure the revenue's right down at the bottom, but um, the, all the off-field stuff that's happening, mm. um, and obviously all the other all the other um, markers that they're they're grading everyone against are pretty high. So that's pretty exciting. Like you know, I'm feeling pretty good right now. Toby, what do you make of that bombshell that Robin has just dropped? York City, York RLFC Knights, the fifth highest team if they were to do it this week. Is he there? He's Sorry. speechless. <laughs> he's speechless. Yeah, he's speechless. Did you hear? Did you hear that, Toby? I, I think I didn't quite understand. So Robin said, if he he had an inside scoop from a director that told. Uh, from the was it the owner of York that told one of your bosses? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So the the owner of York told one of Robin's bosses that if they were to do the grading system this past week, if they if they do it right now, or they'd have done it a week ago, or however however when it was, York would have been the fifth team in the list. They would have been team number five in terms of the fifth best team in the country on those current on the current proposals. What what would you make what do you make of that compared to other teams in not necessarily Super League but other teams in the championship that sit at that level? Because like I don't wanna I don't wanna necessarily name names, but there's there's teams at the top of the championship and the bottom end of the league super league that I would say are levels to, if not slightly higher than York in by my eyes, but would you see them as the fifth best team in the country on proposals? Um, I mean, they have the best, what's it called, don't they? They have the, well, not the best, but they have, like, very good facilities compared to yeah. the rest of the championship. They're very sort of, they're quite a modern and forward-thinking club, I think, and are well in control of their finances. And, you know, I think that does say a lot about them. Um, my only sort of break with it is that capacity-wise, you know, um, they only, they only, they can only bring eight thousand fans into their games and you only get eight thousand people watching the games. And at that point, you know, I think mm. certain teams with the larger stadiums and stuff for me, you know, I think I have to take a little bit, uh, a little bit more weight in just because of the potential of having bigger crowds. Yeah, definitely. It's it's going to be mm. very very interesting to see where this sits and how your and how how these proposals are done. I mean. I'd rather have York in Super League than Cast and Wakefield and Fev. Like just just being honest, because they're not one. They're not an M, they're not a West Yorkshire um, sort of side. They're the East Yorkshire, so it gives you it does give you another York East Yorkshire side in terms of York and Hull. But then in my eyes, I'd I'd rather have them and one of the other Hull teams. I don't care which one. Um, like Hull KR offer you a little bit more on the field in terms of the way they play. Hull FC off offer you the the structure and the off field sort of the way it's run so it'd be very interesting to see how those two clubs are ranked and it's, it's going to be very very interesting to see and i can't wait to hear what some of the proposals are before we get into huddersfield um we didn't mention it last week because we were, we were doing rugby league stuff only one side rejected the proposals last um in the meeting back on the 13th of october and I, for the life of me, now, can't remember which one it was. So I'm going to have to go back and have a look. Um, and I'm so sorry because I can't, I can't remember which club it was. Well, it wasn't Keithley, was it? I believe it might have been Keithley. Yeah. They rejected the they rejected the proposals and they didn't they didn't uh, um, acknowledge them. They didn't they didn't agree with them. Can you, is that is that a shock that those that they haven't they they've sort of said we want promotion relegation, but we're not getting rid of promotion relegation. It's just becoming more of a licensing category grade thing. Does that show? A, does that do? Either of you can answer this. Do you think that shows a lack of ambition from the Keithley Cougars owners? Yeah, I think like Keithley is so far off the Super League, aren't they? I know, I know they're going up to Championship next year, and they did have a strong year in in League One, but like to. For them to want to keep promotion relegation open, like they're not, they're a long way off Super League, so it's kind of, 
who are they to sort of like dictate what happens at the top of the table? I know that sounds really harsh and stuff, but um, yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I actually thought that there would be more people rejecting it. So the fact that we've got one out of um, almost 40 teams, yeah, I, I, I'm actually going to take that as a win and I'm okay with that. Yeah, Heather, what do you make of that situation? I mean, we've not heard from the two teams that abstained. I can't remember, what, I think it was Barrow, I believe, was one. And then the other one, they were just they abstained because they wanted a bit more information. But from a fellow League One sort of team supporter, what do you make that this has been rejected from a from a team that's just been promoted out of League One? I mean, yeah, it sort of it is what it is. Um, yeah, it was sort of a there's there's a lot of power that lies with other clubs, isn't there? And, uh, yeah. It's uh, it's just it's just a poor situation. It's sort of again, it's something I hadn't really know. I didn't really know about until you mentioned it then. Um, yeah, it's just surprising. Yeah, very very surprising. It's like I said, we need we need to know more about what these guidelines and what these uh, proposals and what what the clubs need to do to get an A or a B or a C. We need to really know what what they are. One club that I think is definitely going to get an A. In terms of if they're ranked A B C in terms of on field. Um, play this year I think it's going to have to be the Huddersfield Giants and the squad that they're putting together for the 2023 season is absolutely ridiculous just based on the squad that they've got and the team that I would pick from them, Will Price at full back um, Jake Bibby on one wing, uh, Jermaine McGilbray on the other Kevin Nagama and Jake Connor in the centres Tui Lollahey and Theo Farge in the halves Chris Hill, Matty English uh, Adam O'Brien, Chris McQueen Josh Jones and um, Luke Yates in, in to round off the four pack. On the bench, you've got Isan Masters, George Roby as a backup hooker, Owen Trout and Joe Greenwood as more forwards. Then, just in the squad in general, you've got Leroy Kudjo, uh, Seb Ikehifo, Ashton Golden, Wilson, Ollie Russell, Ines Senior, Jack Ashworth, Harry Rushton, Harvey Levette, Jack Bibby, Sam House are also in the squad. Danny Levi's just left, but it looks like Nathan Peets is coming in and, and we'll sort of make that hooking role a little bit bigger and a little bit more stronger at the very moment at this very moment in time other than maybe that St Helens side there that's a very strong team isn't it yeah I really like this team I, I, I um right at the start of this year I remember saying I like the Huddersfield team I like where they were going and they've just made it better um to to bring on board um O'Connor Jake Connor sorry what a signing. Like he's been one of the most exciting players of the Super League this year. I know he's got his discipline issues and I know that Full FC sort of like the bottom fell out towards the back end of the year and they were playing terribly. But um hopefully um uh, Ian Watson will get the best out of him. And I think they've they've got depth as well. I think that they've that's a, a team that can actually mount a proper season long um attack on on the top spot. Um, and yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, Ian Watson's been sort of like one of the rising stars in terms of like English coaches, and like now he's really got a squad that could could get some uh, silverware and achieve some big things. So it, it's going to be cool to see um, how he how he handles that, rather than being like the the scrappy underdog that sort of surprises people. Like that's going to be um, an interesting challenge and. Yeah, I, I, I really like it. I'm quite excited by this Huddersfield team. I think like the Super League's better off with a strong Huddersfield side. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Toby, this is a, a sign-in that I don't think many people really saw coming. Everyone was sort of like, oh, Jake Connor might be on his way out of um, Hull FC. Leeds, they, we knew he wasn't potentially going to go to Leeds because they, they couldn't afford to keep Zach Hardacre um, because of their, their salary cap issues. The fact he's gone back to Huddersfield means that he's going to be on... A, a decent wage but also Huddersfield only half of it's going to count towards the salary cap because he's come through their academy Will Price in their academy has come through McGilbray, uh, O'Brien English Roby, Trout, Greenwood, Kudjo a lot of these players in their squad that if they were to start every week you wouldn't complain if you're a Huddersfield fan come through that academy system which means they've got more money to spend on, on these big name players like Nagama, Lilahea, Farge Hill and then the likes of Rushton coming uh, coming back over from the NRL, like very very exciting times for a for a Huddersfield Giants fan, isn't it? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a good signing. It's a bit weird, actually, because I swear when, you know, Huddersfield had a bit of an issue with his attitude last time, I think Ian Watson sort of got a big commitment um, to make sure, uh, you know, he, they get the player that Jake Connor's been at hold with season out of him. Um, but I think the only sort of issue that, that I have with it is that you, know, we, you talk about how good Huddersfield look, but they're just they play in front of 5,000 fans in a 25,000 seat stadium, and that you know they don't they're, they're just I just don't think they've got the sort of like reason to go out there and win things that other clubs have around them. Um, and they don't have the fan they don't feel like they have the fans to play for sometimes. Um, so I'll be interested to see how you know all this sort of really good squad ends up actually looking. Um, when they sort of when they're in a close game in the seventy fifth minute and the uh, five thousand home fans aren't, you know, creating a good enough atmosphere for them to play in type situation. Yeah, definitely. I mean we're looking at the Hal F C squad now and without Jake Connor in there it looks like they don't offer a lot in terms of what they, they offer going forward. Obviously Jake Jake Truman is gonna be there, Liam Sutcliffe's gonna be there, they're gonna have Tex Hoy and Brad Dwyer, they've all come in. Uh, Jude Ferreira is joining from uh, London Broncos as a young centre as well, but they have to, they're going to have to rely on the likes of Ben McNamara and Jamie Shaw to lead the way. Potentially Walker is going to sign on a on a permanent deal, but is there room for Zach Hardacre at Hull FC? What do you think if you were Zach Hardacre now? Where where would you be looking if 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 any if you could go to any club without a salary cap issue? Obviously, it's not going to be Huddersfield and it's not going to be Leeds because they're the two clubs that don't need you. Where would you be looking to go? Would you be looking to take a step um, down, maybe play for Fev? What would you want to do? Good question. <laughs> um, I, I do Good enough to stay in Super League, I think, is the main thing that I'd say. I think maybe he's not a desirable fullback anymore, but I think you look at sort of, he was one of Wigan's, oh, Wigan, he was one of um Leeds' his best players and he only fell out with Wigan because he wanted to play full black. Um and he was one of Leeds' his best players, especially um, you know, in the grand final and in the lead up to that. He was a very valuable asset for Leeds. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um apparently at uh, the club posted birthday wishes to Zach Hardacre with pictures of him wearing next season's kit, raising hopes that the former man of steel is staying at Headingley. But this was not the case when Rowan Smith earlier on this month after Leeds got battered by New Zealand said there will be updates when there are updates but at the moment there's no salary cap room to do anything so until then is that nothing can happen we can't do anything until there's some salary cap room currently Zach is uncontracted and there is no salary cap room to make a move I guess that also means that George Burgess won't be coming to Leeds Rhinos anytime soon and playing for a club sort of where around where he was born George Burgess obviously today or yesterday was has been released by St George. Very much a bad time off the field in terms of his his life and injuries and things that he's done that I don't want to bring up because they haven't necessarily been proven. But a lot has gone against him. Do you think we we probably assume he's going to make his way back to Super League, but he needs to come back a different player than what Wigan brought back, don't he? Yeah, I remember when he came back to Super League last time, we were like thinking this is going to be great. And then, yeah, he was just like a shell of himself, wasn't he? So mm. that'll, that'll be interesting to see. And like, hopefully he can, he can pick it up from an England point of view as well. Because, um, you know, he's not, not too old to, to get another England shirt. No, definitely. I mean, you, we've seen the effort that Tom that Tom has been putting in this, this year. And there's there's the World Cup only three years away. So they, they could definitely still have one more World Cup in them. Just quickly going back on the, the World Cup attendances that we spoke about earlier on, Matthew Shaw has tweeted the following. Seems to have been a lot of talk on the Rugby League World Cup attendances yesterday. Can't get a proper feel until deeper into the tournament, but for context, the first four games of 2000 was only 44,000. 2008 was 60,000. 2013 was 67,500, which was the last time it was in um, the UK 2017 was 60,400 and this year 68,240 um, it's worth noting that in 2013 the tournament opened with a double header 
That was in Cardiff and drew 45,052. On the card, it was England versus Australia and Wales versus Italy, which makes Saturday's opening gate at New, um, St. James's Park look even more impressive. But there's no getting away from the fact that the crowd at Warrington last night was disappointing. He'd argue that the rest have been pretty good returns. 6,300 at a game between Ireland and Jamaica. A day after Australia, a much more attractive draw played at the same venue is a solid turnout. What, what do you make of those those numbers then? With, with just under 8,000 more than it was five years ago in Australia. But also we're ahead of 2013, nine years ago, where we opened with a double header in the first the game of the tournament. Yeah, and, and the the tickets in the 2013 World Cup were Which really is, cheap. Yeah, they were really like cheap. 15 quid for the um, for the cheapest areas, um, even less for concessions. So there, there you go. That that shows that it's not affected the the um, the attendances that badly. And think how much more money it's it's produced. Hopefully that doesn't go in the back pockets of some organisers, but instead is invested into our sport. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Toby, we, we were sort of, you were mentioning like Super League teams playing in front of crowds that um, are lower than, than what we've had so far in the World Cup, but are, are you quite happy with those numbers? No, I think I, I think that at the end of the day when you're watching, you're supposed to be watching international spectacle on TV and we're supposed to be selling this international spectacle to the world as this is what rugby league is. To see it being played in front of half empty stands is, is is crap. I think I think it I don't think anyone watches that and goes, Oh, I wanna be part of that. They go, oh, they go, oh, I don't want to be sitting there in the half empty stadium. Um I think that there's a real problem with this and like they really have put too much focus on playing it in the north. Um, which sounds ridiculous, but at the same time, like something like a Greece game, you know, could could a Greece game have been played in London? Mm. Um, could France Greece have realistically been a much better game to play in London, and uh, given the amount of the concentration of people um, of different nationalities that live in London compared to wherever in the north it's been played tonight? Yeah, definitely. Doncaster tonight. Doncaster tonight. Yeah. So yeah, how many Greek teams right are in Doncaster? Yeah, it's a bit, um, bit of a bit of an odd one. Whereas if it's in London, people can actually travel from France and get home. <laughs> It's actually, mm. do you know what I mean? It's it's very difficult. Uh, it's very easy, sorry, for them to get from France to London to go and watch a game and then potentially go home. Um, really quickly, before we get into our seven tackle set, which I'm calling it, because if we record next Monday, we'll time it perfectly. Um, Matt Cooper, um, a former um, rugby league player over in Australia, has met, has tweeted that the St George Illawarra. Um, awards evening was tonight and obviously there's a few players that are over in the World Cup that won't be able to attend but how many players in their main squad of 30 do you think attended the Red V Awards tonight or, or three. La last night oh you've seen it have you yeah, it was three three, three. three players say, it could be 30 <laughs> minus the number of players in the World Cup <laughs> no only, th only three players apparently turned up at the Red V Awards um, wow yeah, he said, I can't believe three players went to the Red V Awards uh, tonight. Actually, I can. The club has no loyalty and honour left. That will stop when Wayne Bennett left. Oh, I don't I don't know what happened. I wasn't really following Australian Rugby League then. I don't know if Toby can shed any light into that situation with Bennett or whether or not you were following it. But yeah, um, yeah, it, it's crazy really when you think only three players turned up for a professional sports team's awards night. I mean, that's, I don't know what to say. I really don't. I feel like those three players must not be in the team group chat as well. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, they're the, they're the last. Wow, that is embarrassing. <laughs> that, I mean, how do you do an awards night with nobody <laughs> there to collect their awards? That's just embarrassing. Yeah, I don't. I really don't <laughs> understand. Um, right then, seven seven tackle set time. It's usually a set of six, but. We, we have to do seven tackles just because it's the Rugby League World Cup and there's more games to fit in and we want to try and get every single game in. Um, current scores with Tonga PNG still to play. They lie at Robin on 84, myself on 83 and Toby on 79. Robin, you've lost a point because you predicted Samoa to beat England um, on Saturday. We've already mentioned that, so don't, please try not to get as many wrong this time. 
But game number one is Wales versus the Cook Islands <coughs> tomorrow night. Is it some? Oh, I can't remember. No, Wednesday night. Where Wednesday are we? Night. Where are we going for this one? I, I, I think it's quite a tough call, and I think the way Italy played against Scotland has got me thinking a little bit, and I kind of want Ro Toby to speak about this a little bit before I make a decision. You want me to lead? Yeah, I want you to lead. It's your country. <laughs> he doesn't know, does he? He doesn't know. <laughs> Oh, you know what? I'll go Wales. I'll I'll lead it off. I'll go Wales. Um, for me, I'm I could see the team winning this, um, but I kind of like the Cook Islands. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll go Cook Islands. Go on, Toby. Is he gone, Toby? I don't know if he wants to select this game. He's still thinking. Oh, no, he's gone. He, you know what he thought? I don't know. I can't. I can't <laughs> pick. Hope, hopefully, he'll come back in, um, or he'll he'll text us his his suggestions um, towards the end. While I, while is he back? Is he here? Toby. Oh jeez. Hello. Hello. No, Robin, I think he's gone. Is Robin even here? I'm still here, yeah. You are still here. You just didn't reply. I thought you'd gone then for a second Sorry, as well. I, it, the connection is going. Should we, should we move on to the next game? And then... Yeah, Australia versus Scotland. This is pretty self-explanatory, yeah. isn't it? I mean, <laughs> Scotland have already had an up, been on the wrong side of an upset. Australia. When I when I saw the Australia squad on um, Saturday night, they like I know that they didn't get the amazing scoreline that England did, but that is such a scary side. The way that they set up behind to play the ball and there's like seven or eight players just like milling around, and you can't read it. And all of a sudden they spring into action and they've every single one of them hits a hole. It's it's so incredible to watch. Um, so yeah, obviously I'm going to pick Australia as well. Yeah, I think we're both going to go for Australia there. Toby's back, I believe. I'm back, yeah. Back. Wales or Cook Islands? One word. Wales. I thought he would. I, th I knew he would. Too much too much loyalty in his he's veins. Only because of Italy, you know. Only because of it. Yeah, that's the thing. It's only because yeah. of the Italy-Scotland result that I'm I'm leaning towards the Wales and the way, they've, the way they're playing. Just because I don't know if the Cook Islands have... They've got a little bit more time than Samoa, maybe. I don't know. Um, the next one was Australia versus Scotland, Toby, and I think you're going to back Australia. us on this one. Yeah, very, yeah. really simple. Um, another quite easy one, I think, here. England versus France. England. England. The next one, I think, is not as easy to predict. Fiji versus Italy. Tough one, that. Very tough. Um, I, want the I want the Italians to win this one. It would be pretty cool, wouldn't it? It would be pretty cool. Um, and then and then maybe James Tedesco would regret picking Australia. You know? <laughs> what, when Australia uh, loses to Scotland, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, they could lose to Italy. That would be they awesome. Could. Oh, imagine, imagine. He would be... I don't know what he'd do with himself if he lost to Italy. Um, so, I... Obviously, that Italy team's come off a red-hot performance against Scotland. They've got all the combination sorted. The Fiji team were just completely outplayed um, and a little bit clunky. But I still think that Fiji had a better side. And I think that they will have learned a lot from that Australia game. Um, and so I'm going to pick Fiji. Oh, Toby. Big decision. Yeah, I still think Fiji have to work hard to score the tries they scored against Australia. Um, whereas I think Scott kind of left Italy to score tries against them. Yeah. Um, a little bit more even for that reason, I'm going to take Fiji. Very, very interesting. Um, game number five, um, I'm going to see this game live, and I can't wait to see the hacker, and I can't wait to see New Zealand record their biggest ever victory in international rugby league, and I've already put New Zealand down to win this game for the both of you. Am I, am I wrong in doing that? No, you can pick New Zealand for me. New Zealand. Samoa Greece is game number six. 
Um, Samoa. Yeah, I, even though Samoa have come off an absolute hammering, they're not they're not going to lose to the Greek side. Are they? Greece played okay tonight. They played well in patches. They scored some. They scored two really nice tries, but. They currently do sit above Samoa in the group, but I don't, I don't think they'll sit above Samoa much longer. Yeah, I agree. And then the next one, a, a, tip, a difficult game and one that I'm going to go first with, I think Ireland have got enough to beat Lebanon, especially now Lebanon have got a man out. Um, Luke Keary, Joe Keyes, Brendan O'Hagan, Richie Myler, that halfback with, with the, the King brothers, the senior brothers playing extremely well together. I think Ireland have got enough to win this game and, and push themselves into second in that group. Oh, it's so hard to call. This is actually going to be such a good game because they're two quite easily matched sides. Um, both with, like, um, strong halfbacks. Oh, difficult, difficult call. It's Mo I, Moses versus Keary, really, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Um, I guess without um, Dewey he. Lebanon are a bit weaker, and I like the island side. I think that I think that they play well together. They understand each other. They um, want to win for each other, and all these things. So, um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Ireland actually for this game. Is it three Irish predictions out of three, Toby, or are you gonna go for Lebanon because you need the points? He's disappeared again. He's very indecisive this evening. Isn't he? <laughs> he's struggling. Uh, shall we? Shall we predict what he's going to pick and see what he what he goes with? I I think he's going to pick Lebanon, just because he needs the points. I don't know if I'm going to be right in that, but this is it's going to be a good game though. Like I think of of all the games that we we're looking at in this set of seven. Yeah, I think that's that's probably the it's going to be the closest. Yeah, definitely. Um. Just for those who want a Rugby League World Cup jersey, if you are not a member of the O'Neills, sign up, you get 10% off, and a Rug I Rugby League Island World Cup replica away jersey, the black shirt, is £47, plus 10% off, so you're looking at just over £40 for a World Cup shirt. Not bad. Not bad at all, it's cheaper than the uh, Greece one, that's for sure. The Greece one's 75 quid. Really, that's crazy. Yeah, I'm but, not the but one. then again, I'm you've, one. you've got to buy it from the um, from Australia. So. Oh yeah, well, so it's forty quid plus thirty quid delivery. Yeah, well, no, it's it's seventy five pound plus whatever delivery. Wow. It's one hundred and thirty six US um, Australian dollars, um, and the Jamaica kit, by the way, is fifty pounds for those that are looking to buy it. Um, yeah, that's actually that's something we haven't spoken about, but the the actual merchandising at the grounds is pretty poor because. All that's available is like the Kappa stuff, so it's all like basically the same all types the of stuff, and stuff yeah. colours. Yeah, so you can't actually get any jerseys at games, which is a shame. I, I picked up a ball yeah. um, last night, I got a Jamaica speed and ball, which is pretty nice. cool. And I said to Giles, I, I might end up getting one for each team that we go to. I'm not gonna, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be very good. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see who wins that argument. Are you are you at the game next weekend? Are you at the New Zealand Jamaica game, or are you at a different game? No, I haven't actually got any next weekend. I've got um, Tonga versus PNG tomorrow night, and then my next one's in Warrington, and it's PNG again versus Cook Island. This is something I lo I looked at where you were, where your games that you were at because obviously we need to plan podcasts and when you're in and when you're not in, etc. You are yeah. at every single PNG game, men and women's World Cup. You know that. Really? I did not yeah. realise that. Yeah, that's look, so your cool. highlighted <laughs> fixtures, you've got Tonga PNG, PNG Cook Islands, PNG Wales in the Men's World Cup. Yeah. And then um, on the 5th of November, um, you've got PNG Brazil. And then you've uh, got yeah, England so PNG. And then there was, and then a, then there was another PNG one. Canada. P PNG Canada, yeah. You've got all <laughs> six PNG games. So uh, the way I see it is you are PNG's number one fan. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna. I might. I did not realize that, but I'm gonna have to definitely get like some PNG merch. Then I feel like I'm riding the the way of the Lens now. Yeah, they're your team, aren't they? In that group, they they are. They are the number one. I just wanted to look at the tickets for New Zealand Jamaica, right? Because I got I, mine were free, uh, key worker tickets and stuff like that. So I'm gonna log in and I'm gonna look at what a price is, what the cheapest price is for New Zealand Jamaica, if I can remember my password. 
Because the the other weird thing is that you buy um, a ticket a ticket bracket, but you can't choose your seat, and they're randomly allocated. So you could be at, like anywhere in the ground, pretty much, like any yeah. quarter of the ground based on your ticket selection. Yeah, and so I've looked we... at my ticket seats. I've looked at my seats for the Rugby League World Cup, and I'm not happy with eight, my eighty five pound. Yeah, I am not impressed. I am I am eye level with the pitch because of the way the pitch oh. is. I am not in a nice place, and I'm not particularly impressed with the the, the cost that that has uh, the cost that that has yeah. outlaid. Like, yeah, not not happy at all. Prices tonight, by the way, for France Greece, you could get tickets from two pound twenty one. Wow, what what who what what do what is that concessions? <laughs> yeah, I guess so, right? But yeah, tomorrow night Tonga versus PNG prices range from fifteen to eighty four pounds. For, for a, like that is it's Australia Scotland the commentary two pound twenty one to eighty four pound uh, England versus France ten pound to one hundred and thirty two pound so you want a good seat at the University of Bolton Stadium you're paying over a hundred pound for it for a group game by the way yeah that, like that's just crazy yeah it's not it's very very difficult um I just don't know. yeah it's it's very very interesting let's see what how much the fi final range tickets are t 20 pounds to 216 pounds that's wow. ridiculous I'm, I'm in category C oh, Toby has to text us back and I was right oh, okay. he's gone for Lebanon interesting. he has gone yeah. for Lebanon so there's no premium seats available at that price by the way the best price ticket you can get the, sorry, the highest price ticket you can get is on the west stand 205 which is uh, W205, which is right behind the goal line, right behind the posts, right? Yeah. If you want them in the pre in the club seat in the in the adult section, two hundred and four pounds to sit behind the posts. Um, that is mental. Yeah, if you want that specific area. Um, that's a, that's a season ticket. Yeah, that's that's the cost of a season ticket at a, a championship club. Which is very very disappointing. Oh, yeah, probably more than that. Category really. A, uh, which is what color? That would be really nice if we could uh, red. Which is to be fair, I sat in category A seats for the. Um, no, I didn't. I sat in category B seats for the rugby league, well, for the Super League Grand Final, um, and yeah. they, they cost us a pretty penny. Um, they cost us about forty two pound fifty each for category B for the same category in the challenge in the two in the World Cup final double header. 110 pounds wow so i i, I, I really i really time, hope but... that the the grand final is well attended i really yeah. i hope that they that the, the prices don't put people off yeah i said so i can I. understand why they would but mm, it's really disappointing yeah. to see um yeah really really disappointing i mean the cost of hotels the cost of travel everything is is absolutely crazy right now and the cost i know i know two years ago when the tickets came out two years ago there wasn't a cost of living crisis and now there is but it, it's really really sad to see um that people that people have obviously not been able to afford to go um of the games in all tournaments that are sold out you can't get tickets for the wheelchair semi-finals okay i think i'm going to that one that's that's in sheffield yeah and but you can get tickets to every other game cool that's the only sold out venue is the what is this i guess there's, there's not so many there's not a very big capacity there is there no probably not right not very much at all so it'd be very very interesting yeah. to see i mean i'm going to the semi-final at ellen road and i um uh, they those tickets were free through a uh, key worker so i'm really i'm glad we were able to get them but you're looking at between 15 and 132 pounds uh premium seat in west hospitality uh, in the west stand which uh it doesn't say; just says West Hospitality, one hundred and thirty-two pounds for Ellen Road, which I, it's not bad. Like that's that's not bad, is it? When you look at mm. hospitality grounds and stuff, so very very interesting to see. We'll look at more of the prices and the attendances as the World Cup goes on. We'll focus more on the women's and the wheelchair tournaments next time out, and we'll and we'll get into more of yeah. that. Um, Toby says goodbye. He's sorry he dropped out halfway through. Uh, Robin, thank you very much for joining me. This has been the Biff Rugby League podcast. We're brought to you by Swinging Arms and Shoulder Charges. It's Rugby League World Cup season, and I'm so excited. I can't wait for England to lift the trophy at the end of it. Uh, see you all next week. Have a good one.